Awesome. All right, I'll welcome everyone in. Uh oh. Hi, everyone. Rebecca, I got to go out and come back. I somehow did something. Darn it. <laughs> That's fine. You can do I that. can't find it. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, hey, Tessa. Rebecca. Hi, Jeff. Good to see you. See you too. And Terrence. Hi. Oh. Oh, hi, Rebecca. How are you doing today? I'm pretty good. How are you? It's been good. a while. It has. I like your background. You changed oh, that to a beach scene. <laughs> thanks. How's it going, Terrence? I'm pretty good. How are you? Jeff? You're not doing all right yourself. I'm doing just fine. Good. Uh, I missed you the last time I was out in uh, San Diego. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of it's kind of kind of busy sometimes. Yeah. It well, happens. Terrence and Jeff, I'm so excited for us to connect later this month. Um, Jeff is going to be coming back out to San Diego on October 29th. And so we'd love to, yes. to get together with you guys. Yeah. It's uh, two weeks. Awesome. Yep, two weeks from Friday. Yes. So I want to introduce you both to Lisa, um, who's our guest speaker today. Uh, Jeff, Lisa, Jeff is from Massachusetts and he is a one of our core team members and one of our volunteers um, who helps us. And he's basically been a part of almost every single lunch and learn that we've done. And we've done 68 to date, which is amazing. Oh. Um, and Jeff is a self ad advocate and has grown. So we're so proud of you, Jeff, and all that you do. Thank you. <laughs> and then Terrence is one of our, um, is our, is our spokesperson and liaison to the San Diego Symphony Community Partnership that we have um, with the Meet the Instruments series. So they Absolutely did- Absolutely remember. Yeah. Terrence, do you want to say anything about that? Oh, um, oh sure. Yes. Um, yeah, it's been a while since, um, yeah, since I'm a still spokesperson of the liaison for the San Diego Symphony. So um, I'm still a, uh, Yes, I agree. And so I'm, I'm still a musician. I play a, a trombone. Mm -hmm. but also, I, I compose music. Mm -hmm. And um, also, um, I'm still going for the, like, the associate's degree. And I, I think I think in science, like audio production engineering oh. or like, like community college. Awesome, Terrence. Yeah. Oh, thanks. All of it, all of Terrence's videos are on our YouTube channel too, for anyone to watch and it's awesome. Hi, Rich. Hi. <laughs> hey, everybody. All right, well, I'm just- Oh, hey, Rich. I, hey, what's going on, Terrence? I'm pretty good, how are you? Good, good. good. Hey, Jeff, <laughs> Lisa, everybody. Hey, Rich. Hey, hey Tessa. <laughs> <laughs> I love our lunch and learns. We also have Todd Hoff on here. Hi, Todd. <laughs> you can type in the hey, chat. Hey, hey Dana. Probably oh. multitasking. <laughs> hey, guys. I'll just be listening in today. Awesome. Awesome. Dana, you wanted to say something? I did. Um, first, um, it's great to see everybody, and I'm so excited to have Lisa here. Uh, Lisa, we are in, one month out yesterday from our annual neuroscience conference that I know you, you that um, you know we're doing, and um, we sent out the registration yesterday. Um, Dr. Motri, our chairman, is super excited that this is going to be on the UCTV platform and um, all virtual. And he's you know from Brazil, and Dr. Motri's from Europe, so it's going to be much more um, open to other countries, which he's thrilled about, and so are we. But I wanted to share with you on this call right now, Terrence Patridge and Jeff Snyder have been on our Living Autistically panel at the Neuroscience Conference, which is really what differentiates the conference, is having people living on the autism spectrum to educate these renowned researchers in our community up here on the Mesa in La Jolla, who are doing, you know, Dr. Motri has the largest um, autism research lab in the world. And so the work that Terrence and Jeff has done to really help just people even in Dr. Motri's lab, which is 17 researchers, none of them had ever met someone with autism, which is completely unbelievable, but true. Um, and Terrence and Jeff have been hugely involved in this conference and 
Um, I'm just so excited, everybody, that our conference is less than a month away. Rich brought in our first $25,000 platinum sponsor, Neurocrine, which is phenomenal. And Lisa, I think that you will find this really important, and I'm really excited to share this with you. I'm Neurocrine, excited about it. Neurocrine um, does a lot with seizure disorders. And the work that they're doing is very, very specific. And it's landau Kleffner syndrome. And it's stuff that Dr. Troner is extraordinarily involved in. So I know that you might want to go to even Neurocrine with us and see a tour because they're right here in San Diego. Um, and we hope to do clinical trials with them, with our, you know, our community from Autism Tree. So I just, um, you know, I really wanted to make sure you knew who was on the call. And Todd is usually not here. He came specifically just mm. to um, reconnect with you, knowing that we're trying to um, be more connected and we're Todd and I are both really excited and along with Rich and Rebecca and everybody here so thank you I have turned it over to Rebecca and I'm looking really forward to this today with everybody thank you Dana so I'll do a little quick refresher for those of you it's been a little while since our last lunch and learn so a quick a couple Zoom rules, please mute yourself when you're not speaking. We recommend speaker view for presentation. Video sharing is optional, though I love to see all your smiling faces. And please type all questions and comments into the chat. Please make use of the chat. We love seeing everybody's interactions um, and your thoughts while our guest speaker is speaking. Um, we will have a Q&A at the end as well where you can unmute yourself and ask any questions um, to Lisa today. Um, so a quick update from Autism Tree. Um, we have now reached over 661,000 people through all of our social media channels. We started tracking our social media since, uh, since last March of 2020, uh, when COVID, the COVID pandemic first hit San Diego. Our posts have been shared over 1,074 times. So thanks to everybody who's sharing all of our content um, and our posts, our videos, um, our pictures of all of our events that are happening each week and much more. We've now posted 436 videos on our YouTube channel. Um, so we post these every week. Um, so subscribe today if you haven't yet. It takes a minute, super easy um, to stay connected um, to our community. Um, we've posted 382 of those videos since March of last year. Um, so I gotta give a shout out to all the volunteers and program directors and uh, my amazing interns and just our volunteer community who really stepped up and provided content and connection online um, for our kids and families during this rough time. Um, we, one of our series that we provided during this time was Reading with Autism Tree, where our volunteers read their favorite children's book to our kids. We still have those available online. Um, we posted 109 of those and reached over 54,000 people just through that series. Um, we've also provided 300 and 36 virtual and a few in-person events to date since last, last March. Um, we are taking all precautions um, for all of our any, any of our in-person events, but most of our events are virtual. Um, we have 24 events coming up between now and the end of November. Um, like I mentioned, we offer 19 of our 20 programs, 18 are virtual, and four are in-person. So we have a few hybrid programs going on, our adaptive dance, um, and more in-person events like our National Charity League. Um, NCL Girls Mentor Program. Um, our Bridge to the Beach happened this year, and we're also partnering with community partners um, all over San Diego County to, to bring in-person events to um, those who want to come out. Um, we are staying masked and all of taking all precautions, um, but I really encourage any of you to, you know, attend our virtual events and uh, if you would like to volunteer or learn more about what's coming up, you can reach out to me directly and I'd be happy to plug you into all that's going on at our Autism Tree family. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass it back over to Dana and she's going to introduce Lisa Fisher officially. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, sorry, Dana. Unmute yourself, please. Thank you, Rebecca. It's uh, really remarkable to me that we're 68 weeks today. And once again, um, on the pre-call uh, that Rebecca and I do each week with the speaker, it's just completely remarkable to me that there is literally no accident, the timing of when a speaker comes each week to Autism Tree. And 
I think um, that I'm just really in gratitude that, you know, Lisa, we're reconnecting. Um, it is kind of emotional to go all the way back. I can't think of any speaker, um, <laughs> literally, that I go this far back with. Um, Lisa and I met when my son Garrett was diagnosed and we did, I didn't want to do a birthday party for G. Like I didn't want to do a normal kid's birthday party. Like, I mean, just like you would do it at Chuck E. Cheese or whatever. Um, I wanted, I was really worried where he was going to go uh, to kindergarten. And so we did this fundraiser for his three-year birthday when he was diagnosed. And we asked everyone to do a different level heart. <laughs> And um, I think, I can't remember, Lisa, if I had started, we hadn't started autism tree yet, but we had like a big tree up and you could buy a heart at the birthday party and they were different values and we were sticking them on the wall. And we were trying to raise money for um, La Casa Foundation and we wanted the money to go to uh, a kindergarten. And um, I met Lisa, is my first memory with you, Lisa, and your husband and Blake was at that birthday party in the San Diego Charger timeout band was playing and we had like Teletubby character and it was at La Casa Foundation, which was uh, off six, Sixth Avenue in San Diego. And it had this whole place where you could do OT and play like kind of like a gymboree, but it was very sensory based. And Todd and I used to go there on weekends with Garrett, like you would go to gymboree, but we would go there. And it's just kind of remarkable. I sort of remember everything about that time period, Lisa, when I think of you. Um, and just kind of that, just, I don't know, being in hyperdrive, sort of like I, every day when I, as a mom, I wouldn't even feel my feet hitting the ground. I, I mean, I was just thinking like, what am I going to do for my son? How am I going to help him? It was just kind of not describable. The only thing that I can liken it to is the Amber Alert. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's what it felt like every day of my life. When I think of the Amber Alerts today, I, I remember how it felt when I was trying to figure out what to do for Garrett then. And um, I just remember you and your husband so vividly that night and what you were going through with Blake. And I remember Todd and I at the end of the night walking out and seeing that you were going through a lot with Blake and just remembering like the whole video of it. Um, I know, I think he didn't want to get in the car and it was really challenging for you guys. And I know Todd and I were just taking it in and feeling um, like a lot of love for you and your husband and, and even your son. We were just coming at this new and just thinking how much like we've always had a lot of love for each family. And it goes all the way back to before Autism Tree that night with you. Mm -hmm. And I remember we kind of had this situation where we were be like, oh, we have to worry about the doors at the party because we didn't want some kids to run out them. And um, that was a new thing that I was experiencing. And it wasn't just um, that date. I remember at Garrett's two-year birthday party worrying how I was going to keep him at his birthday party at my parents and deciding to do it in the backyard, not the front yard. And because I knew he'd run the whole neighborhood. He wouldn't stay at his party. Um, so there's just so many things that I was learning back then, Lisa, and just, just to go all the way back and think how intense it was for us as moms and how I'll always, you know, always feel a lot of um, connection to you and your family, because when you go through those things, just like trying to gra grab onto a diagnosis, which is what we were doing at that point, um, it's just not something that you ever forget. Like you can go back to that moment and you just, it's like a tidal wave of emotion. It, you just never forget. And so I always, um, you know, look forward to staying in touch with you. And I think it's no accident that Rich has been launching this program and sort of like you coming back and reconnecting with us and with Rich has brought something forward that hasn't really We've been, as we know, in early intervention, and we've done over 20,000 preschool screenings, and we've spent so much time and energy in our first 18 years at Autism Free with that. And I think you're having a part of us doing a pivot, meaning that we already know early intervention is critical and works. And now we have over 200 teens um, that we want to make sure are going to find the best opportunities, whether it's trade school or college or autism at work um, or any number of things in between. And then you've brought forth, what about the 80%? What 
the rest of life after early intervention. And I think, you know, because we're 18 years old, it just can come at a better time. And then you're going to share today your own, um, you know, thing that's going on that has really made you embrace like being a speaker today, which I feel very um, honored and blessed by. And I just want you to know that that is why these lunch and learns are so meaningful and are going to be something we use ongoing. We never imagined, Lisa, that we would use these lunch and learns as a resource constantly with other families, other community partners. It's, it's a long list of people that we've sent these videos. And so um, I just want you to know, I really appreciate you not just being here, but actually helping guide us into this next generation. And I'd like to say with every strength that I have in me as an individual, that I want to see our community, um, and not just San Diego, far beyond that. Anyone that is neurodiverse, we need to do better for this next generation. You know, we're gonna be looking at grandchildren, and great grandchildren for some of our grandparents that have been really advocates for our children. So that's something that I find myself saying every day is we need to do better together. We need to make sure this next generation has more doors, more opportunities, an easier experience from the get-go. Um, and I think, you know, Rich has been working tirelessly, as you know, on one place, which would be an incredible difference um, in, San, in the San Diego community. So um, thank you for the heart that you have, not just for your son and your family, but far beyond. I, um, I feel like you've always touched me since the day I met with your level of um, commitment to doing what you can when you can. And that's all we could ever ask for. Thank you. I'm going to show this quick picture of uh, Lisa and Dana and Todd. Dana, do you want to say anything about this picture? <laughs> uh, no, I'm going to let Lisa, I'm going to pass it over to Lisa. <laughs> Oh yeah, there we are at an event that your son actually introduced the speaker, as I recall, and we <laughs> hadn't seen each other in a long time. So that was us meeting up. It was a great, a great evening. Yeah. And not that long ago. <laughs> no, maybe like a year and a half ago or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Lisa, you also requested that I show. Yeah. I just wanted to start off. Um, so thank you very much, Dana. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, this is a picture of just Blake in this last month. So I just kind of wanted to see uh, you to see what he looks like now. Um, this picture, he loves Mexican food, uh, is his favorite. And that's him at a Mexican restaurant. And he loves the car. He actually sits in the car often for maybe over an hour in our garage and just is very happy to sit there <laughs> and wait in the car. It's kind of funny. But anyway, I, I have some other pictures to show. But um, I just wanted you to see who he is um, right now. And I told uh, Rebecca and Dana that um, I'm going to start with a little story that I wrote. Um, I forgot about this story. And uh, last week, a girlfriend of mine that I hadn't seen for a long time from Los Angeles called me. Uh, and she, she has a severe diabetic son. So we'd always kind of connected on disabilities, that type of thing. And she has a very big struggle with him. And he recently just got diagnosed also with autism at age 15. And she said, you know, I was going through my emails and, and I saw this story that you wrote and I was so moved by it. I forgot about it. And I also had forgotten about it. And I said, what, what story was that? And so she said, I'm going to send it to you. So I read it and it is a sad story. Um, and it's how I felt at the time. Uh, I will tell you that when you look at Blake right now, we've had many years of him being uh, pretty much behavior free and a happy guy uh, as low functioning as he is. I would say, you know, autism is mild, moderate, severe, profound. I mean, he's more on the severe side and recently you know, doesn't have, hasn't had a lot of behaviors and so would be considered um, an easier person. He's not, he's uh, almost, he's considered nonverbal, even though he does have a little bit of, of language. But anyway, I thought I'd start off. First of all, I wanted to show you the picture to show you that he does, uh, that's how he presents now. But I thought, since Dana said, 
why don't you talk about what's on your heart? Since this arrived just in the last week, I thought it was just a sign that I should probably start with this um, story that I wrote. And I think what it represents is that there are a lot of families, and I certainly have spoken to a lot of them, that are really have really felt this way. And I've had families call me and it's, it's, you know, embarrassing in a way to have such a severe child and it's hard to put yourself out there, but this is the way that I felt at this time. And I know, I know that a lot of other families have been in this space also. So let me um, start it. And ironically, um, it's all, it, the holidays are coming. The um, story is called the ornament. And so it's about five minutes and then I have some other things I wanna talk about. I took out the ornament from the box. It was of course Christmas. Always a great time shared by family and friends. Isn't that how it goes? My adorable twins were nearby taking out Christmas items for the tree in our home. My husband was up on the ladder getting the large ones in just the right spot. The Christmas tunes were playing. I had the cookies in the oven, hot chocolate nearby. I'm not sure if we weren't nominated for a Hallmark card. It was then when I got out the ornament and it was then that my heart stopped. It was a picture of my little boy, Blake, when he was about four. It was a school ornament. I love that, don't you? When the teachers take the time to make such a memorable item. It's not until you get to remember them that you really appreciate them. It's not until then that they become so memorable. When they arrive home from school, they're cute. In years to come, they are priceless treasures. But there it was, that big red ornament. The ornament had a picture of Blake on it. He was so cute with his light blue eyes. Everyone always commented about how beautiful they were. He had his cute blue school shirt and pretty blonde curls. He was so beautiful really more than my other two, and I'm the mom, I know. You see, he wasn't at our Hallmark card the perfect evening. He wasn't there with the music, the cookies, and the beautiful home my husband and I had worked so hard to afford for our family. You see, he doesn't live with us anymore. He's not here. I guess he's really not a part of our family if anyone was counting. He moved out when he was 10. I remember the day I bought a bed in the bag from the linen store. Those are for college students, aren't they? For the dorm room? That's what I remember thinking. He was only 10 and he was moving on to his own life. He was only 10 and I wasn't gonna be tucking him in anymore, combing his hair and putting him on the bus to school. He was moving into a home two hours away from us. He was moving to a group home, a home that was for autistic children. It was a crisis home, a home for families and child in crisis. We had certainly been in crisis in our family. There had been night after night of no sleep, brain injury, autism. Damaged brains apparently don't let the host sleep, at least not our son. Night after night, we would wake up and lay in panic. What kind of a night was it gonna be? Was he gonna roam? in his room for a time and then go back to sleep? Sometimes that happened. Sometimes we were lucky. His door was locked so we, he couldn't get out. Otherwise we couldn't trust that he wouldn't roam the house and get into trouble if we slept on. Some nights we'd breathe a sigh of relief as we heard him settling in and going back to bed after a time. But most, most, most nights, especially as the years wore on, he would start banging, banging on the door from the inside because he knew we would open it. Banging because a car ride sounded good to him. Banging because we would do what he wanted and, he didn't, and we didn't want our twins to wake up. Wake up and know how bizarre their lives had become. We were trying to pretend as much as we could that we were normal, normal enough so they could have something called a childhood. When he was three, he was so normal, talking, laughing, beautiful, but his days started to look different. He wasn't interested in other children. He didn't play with toys. He obsessed over the same movie videos. He carried objects around the home. But if he talked, it was only to tell me what he wanted or to repeat videos over and over again. He never looked back at that theme park when he was playing in the water. What child doesn't look back at three to see their mother? 
Some say theirs didn't, but it was different. Something was wrong. Something, but what was it? Grand mal seizures right before he turned three. I remember the night, him throwing his head back, screaming, we need help, who can help? The number one pediatric neurologist would not see anyone new for a year, a one-year wait. I can't wait, so I swallow myself and go into her office and wait, and I waited all day and said I wouldn't leave, not until she saw me. She granted me an audience after patients after a patient-filled day and told me to bring him to her the next. We bring him hopes held high. She is so important, so hard to get to. She must have answers. Her answer was autism, but there was hope. Hope it was a bit different than autism, different enough that a huge dangerous amount of steroid medication might help him. One he would be on for months, blowing his body up into a strange looking child. One that would freeze his brain, freeze the damage of what was going on, Freeze it with a prayer that maybe it would stick. Maybe there'd be a miracle. Miracles do happen. Miracles and prayer, I heard so many miracle stories. But ours was not to be a miracle. Ours was a swirling spiral down, down for a very long time. There were hours of therapy. We were going to cure him, you see. Every two hours, the doorbell would ring. Someone else to work with Blake. Someone else to keep his mind organized and active someone else to take the life we all learn and make it into a small drill. A drill that was repeated over and over again until it looked natural. So his responses would look like he learned them like a regular kid, but he wasn't, he was just memorizing life. He studied emotions. He studied what happy looked like, a smiling face. Then he could think about what it looked like. He didn't know how it felt. You have to expect him to know, just memorize. Well, that would have been great if it had worked, if those teeny tiny drills over and over again had stuck, making him seem more normal. But it couldn't be on those dangerous drugs forever. No, they would kill him. So they were reduced, and so was his mind. It couldn't hold on to thoughts anymore. All those little skills he had learned were disappearing. Everything was disappearing. His brain was reporting abnormal activity in the reports. They couldn't stop the damage. At least he didn't sound like a robot. I read about that. Someone actually lost their inflection in their voice and sounded robotic. I was glad, so glad he didn't have that. But then one day his voice started to sound flat, flatter and flatter. I couldn't believe in front of my eyes he was doing the very thing I feared, but it didn't stop. The robotic voice kept coming. I wonder now what it used to sound like, but I don't know. I wasn't good at family movies. I wanted him to get better first, better before I took those movies. Now those memories are washed away with time. He needed to imitate play. Well, I was gonna make sure that happened. I played with his toys with him. His therapist did. First he picked it up, but eventually it was all lost. All play was gone. For years, he was so cute and easy. And then the behaviors came. A therapist told me long ago, if he doesn't learn to talk, he'll learn to use other ways to communicate. Unfortunately, it wasn't the way the speech therapist had hoped. Yes, he learned the picture exchange communication system for a few things. For most things, he used his fists. His frustration and anger were too much. As he grew, so did his strength. So he was too much. Soon he was too much for me. Too much for me to defend myself on occasion. Oh, I'd have good days and I'd think, this isn't so bad. I can do it. Soon as retreating from the world, I did not want to put him in a bad situation so he would react. It was easier to stay home. Easier with all the locks and gates so he couldn't get out. There were funny moments. Moments of me finding him in the neighbor's pool, the firemen coming to look for him, the lifeguard helicopter, nine squad cars looking for him for an hour. One hour until they found him a mile down swimming in the ocean. That wasn't such a funny moment. The lifeguard having to swim out a different day on a rip current to get him, his brother trying to save him and almost getting swept away himself. But he's gone now. He's on so many drugs, drugs to manage his behavior. Years. He does make it easier for everyone to be with him. He looks drugged to me, but I don't always have much to say because in the very nice home we bought with another family for the boys to live in, it's not my choice. I've given my mother's hat to AIDS. For the most part, AIDS have no love or interest in my son. They have to be there. It's their job. They're there to do the least amount of work they can. Sure, some may have some heart for him, but in my heart, I know some do not. He's so handsome, 
that's for sure how they could they could care. But I really don't know that they do. I know when I complain about his inadequate care, or if I go against it, I'm never sure how they're going to treat him. Or that's what I think. The caregivers aren't as smart as our friends who have advanced degrees. Our friends and families would never let their child live in this situation. That is, unless they were in this situation. Friends and family are so happy that Blake is in a good spot. They see our family thriving with him here. They think seeing us as being normal and Blake is with experts, experts who make minimum wage. I don't argue, I just listen. Listen to my heartbreaking, but most of the time I just don't think. I, I don't think about what's happening, but then I forget and take up ornament out of the box. I forget I might have to run across a memory and my heart stops. It stops forever. That ornament was cute the day it came home. And like I said, it's a memory that's a treasure. I guess I never knew that that memory in life would be too hard for a mother to ever treasure. That is a sad story. And that's where I was um, when Blake was 10 years old. But life has dramatically improved. But I want to show that that is where people live. And they lived there for a lot longer than I did. Anyway, he came home after eight, uh, two years in Costa Mesa at the crisis home. And we bought a home with another family. And we had an operator run it. Um, he was there for a few years and he went back to the Institute for Effective Education School, which is a wonderful school, not the right place for Blake. It was kind of an indoor school. And then he went into Pioneer Day School. Pioneer were some of the best years Blake's ever had. It was a joy to go down there and see people who really care. And he was outdoors all the time, all around Ocean Beach. Everybody in Ocean Beach knew him. And Ocean Beach is a very forgiving community and peace, love, rock and roll to all the hippies homeless down there who appreciate, who appreciate all the kids with autism that wander all over that neighborhood. Um, unfortunately, at the home that we had, Blake was abused. Uh, so he was taken out and um, we then, um, things kind of fell apart there. We sold the home and he came home for 18 months. And those 18 months, some of the months were, were fine. And he has, he was certainly less behavioral uh, by far by that time. But then behaviors kind of started happening again. And we were looking for placement. Working with the regional center, I um, have some great things to say about the regional center. When, when the chips are down, I had Michael Ralston, who was an amazing guy, head of behaviors, who really worked with me to try to get all the services that we could. We got a lot of help from the regional center. Um, that he, was, uh, he also had to go to Children's Hospital Psych Ward for a short amount of time. Then he ended up in the sales home that he's in now. He's been there for seven years. And there's been many ups and many downs. Um, recently, they've uh, merged with another company called People's Care and things are getting better. But we've had some, some good times there and some not so good times there. But the placement is what's worked for us. Um, unfortunately, again, and abuse is very high in group homes. He was abused earlier this year. And I've had a lot of experience now working with law enforcement. So currently um, his case is at the San Diego District Attorney's Office. And we're gonna see if they're gonna prosecute the women who confessed and I have pictures and still it may not be enough to make things right and how I want it to be. Um, so that's where Blake, so Blake is right now at a day program. Uh, the, and, and that's one place that I'd like to see a lot of improvement. It's called Options for All. It's okay, but it's a far cry from when he went to Pioneer Day School. And I would, of course, love, the funding is dramatically decreased when they go to um, day programs. It goes down to about a third of what you go in a special day school. But we have a lot of fun moments. And I wanna just talk about a little bit of those at the end of what I'm saying. Um, we have something, he loves going to Costco. When he gets to Costco, he runs, he's 6'3", and he gallops through the whole darn place. 
and we call it the lift and it's pretty funny. So um, if anybody happens to have a Coke in their cart um, and I'm not keeping an eye on it, I might turn around and Blake is holding the Coke. <laughs> and I have to say, oh my gosh. And a person is <gasps> standing there like this, looking very shocked. And I say, oh, I'm so sorry about the Coke. My husband used to have $5 bills. He would hand out to each person and say, here, please go buy yourself five Cokes. Um, so that's kind of funny. And he loves girls' arms. I know that sounds funny, but if the girl has a tank top on, he likes to kind of touch them on their arms like this. So I'm quick to say immediately, oh, he loves the cute girls. So everybody loves flattery. And I will tell you from the bottom of my heart that I do know that when Blake interacts with people, he always has a huge smile. He was always um, in a very good mood when we're out and we're doing things. And I am positive that he's changed people's lives. And I have a lot of people from Costco that come up to me and they recognize him. They come give him a big hug. Blake is very affectionate. He's very social. He likes to be hugged and he, and he loves to be around people. He loves car rides. That's for sure. So why don't you show some of the other pictures and then I'll just kind of describe what was going on kind of based on the talk that I just did and the sadness and then the more positive. So that's Blake. Uh, oh, this is um, our Christmas card last year, which is pretty funny because you can see that um, myself, my husband, my twins, we actually were on a ski vacation and there's Blake. He's a little warmer than the rest of us because we photoshopped him in. I thought that was kind of funny and some people uh, busted me on that one. So that was our Christmas card so you could see our family. This is uh, when Blake was first being diagnosed at three. And um, I think a lot of people are familiar with self-stimulatory behavior. And I kind of picked this one because that was something that he did a lot with his eye. And he would, and he would kind of move, mo rotate his eye around a little bit. And he and I think he does it to see better in 3D is what some people with high functioning autism have told me. I'm not sure. The one on the left has uh, been we actually have that in a very large uh, kind of art rendering. And it just kind of reminds us of Blake, you know, going on his journey. And that's been one of my favorite pictures of him. And the Terry organization actually has that in one of their conference rooms. So those are some of the pictures they had. Uh, Blake loves the ocean. I think you heard me say that he was found um, an hour swimming in the ocean. Um, he, he would go in for hours. Unfortunately, as he's gotten older, he, he doesn't like it as much. I think the cold water's uh, gotten to him sometimes, and then he's, he's gotten a little bit more hesitant. The sad story here on the right is the bed in the bag. That was his very first group home that he was in in Costa Mesa, and that's the bed in the bag that I bought him because he liked the ocean so much. So that's where that one came from. This is when he was up in Costa Mesa and just kind of showing some of the signs of autism. He, he um, you can see with Santa Claus, he doesn't really care much for Santa Claus at all. It's always about the, you know, candy cane, etc. But there he was at one of the schools in Costa Mesa. So that was another picture of him. This is his brother. This is when he was a little chunkier. He's very thin now. And these are his twin brothers. And so I just wanted to show a picture of them playing in the pool with him because I thought it was really, really cute. He's and he does enjoy being with his brothers for sure. Uh, that my we have a little speedboat. And this is probably like four years ago or something. And we take him out on there on Sundays a lot. And you can see he's very happy and um, you know, in a good mood. And most of the time he is in a good mood. Uh, that's just, I just thought it was a cute picture. And so I thought I'd share it. Maybe I, this is just when he was in include autism. This is my last picture, which is kind of out of sequence in a way I, I'd sent it wrong, but uh, I just, he was in the after school program include autism, which was an amazing program also. And that's his little buddy Dante, who um, I actually helped his mom uh, find two different home placements. And he's in a very good group home right now. Also, she's very happy. So that's kind of the story. And I, I could have chosen more because Blake does light up people's lives. And I will tell you that I have taken him to fundraisers for um, Pioneer Day School where he's, you know, obviously aged out and every therapist there is crying and telling me uh, he was one of my very favorite students. And since they're saying that around other parents, which is kind of, which is a kind of a not very good thing to say, I know they're really telling the truth. And so um, we've had many, many 
great times with him and he does change people's lives and life is not like it was, but he still lives in a group home. And I do tell people often that call me and they're looking for placement and they think they're, you know, they think, oh, it's going to be a better place for him. Well, it's, you know, no one's better in a way than being with the parent. But when you think of the entire family, you have to think of the entire family. And we were losing our, one of our twins significantly was in therapy at the time. And the therapist told us, you know, you either move Blake out or you're going to lose the son too. So you have to think of the whole family and it's not always the, it's not a great option sometimes, but sometimes it's your only option. And then you just need to make it work from there. So I'll look for any questions if you have any. Jeff, you have your hand raised, go ahead. Um, Lisa, great, great, great job. I, um, I mean, I was, you know, I was kind of picturing um, some of the things that, you know, Blake was doing and stuff, but um, one of the issues that I think a lot of, you know, families such as yourself um, go through is that you really don't know what kind of people are going to take care of our loved ones. And um, you really have to um, understand, and people really have to understand that some of these people are really wolves in sheep's clothing. And this is why we need to run background checks on them because when we're putting our loved ones in the care of these people, we need to ensure that you know there's not gonna be any abuse or anything and like or anything like that and we actually know someone um we have a family friend who, who has a son that is severely autistic and she actually runs an organization called community autism resources and sometimes i'll see her and her son in the supermarket that i work at and um and you know they and you know he also has a lot of like mentors so and, and, and they're very, very, they're very good with him. But um, I mean, but that's the one thing that we need to, we as individuals need to kind of be aware that we want what's best for our, our, our neurodiverse loved ones, but we also need to be, um, we also need to be, you know, aware and ensure that they're going to be safe. And I mean, take it from me when I was, when I was going through the education when I was first starting, you know, education, and after I was first diagnosed, I, one of the schools that I looked at was a place called the Wolf School. And what they did was whenever someone was having a bad day, they would tie them down and, you know, make them wear a helmet just so they can protect their heads. But it was, it was kind of, the, the methods were kind of barbaric in, in a way. And, um, you know, fortunately, I, didn't end up going down that path. So it's very, very, um, it's very important that that, fam that families take these things one step at a time. And, and part of my mission as a self-advocate and public speaker is to help these families understand, is to help families, you know, understand that they have access to the resources that they have and and this is especially true in like some of the rural areas, uh, particularly my sister lives in Virginia and, you know, they don't have a lot of, you know, a lot of families down there don't have any resources. And especially with, you know, the ratio being one in 54, then that is, um, you know, the, the urge is more important than ever. So, but, and, and I think, you know, you, you, you shared your story very well, Lisa, and I, and I really commend you for that. Well, thank you. And, and group homes do run background checks, like you said, but it's really just the police, you know, they do that. So unless the person has been convicted, like, you, you know, so you really don't know who you're hiring. That is the truth. And it is tough. Um, I mean, I think cameras are, that is my thing that I'm, I'm championing is cameras in group homes. So um, anyway. And uh, actually, Lisa, um, are you familiar with um, Tom Island in any way? Mm -hmm. He's a, um, well, he actually lives uh, near lot. He lives in uh, Santa Clarita and he and his mom, um, Emily, they, they train individuals and families for how to interact with the police and rescue mm -hmm. personnel. So, I mean, if you like, I can send you his, um, I can send you his website uh, in, 
in, in the chat wall for you to um Yes, to definitely. Work in, so. I would always like to learn any more information and hopefully we could translate it into something here. I know there has been some training the regional centers of law enforcement, but always yeah. more knowledge is power. Yeah. You know, um, also, Lisa, I don't um, typically know what a parent does for a living. It's not what it might, you know, at Autism Tree, we listen to where the parent is at and what their concerns are with their child, and that's our focus. But I only learned recently when Terrence became our official spokesperson with the San Diego Symphony that Terrence's mom works at the regional center. So I just wanted you to know that. Terrence, how do you say your mom's name? Sometimes is I want to say um, it yes. Um, sorry, Yasmin. Um, her name is uh, Therese Davis. I can type that in the chat. Just in yeah, case. she's wonderful. Your mother is wonderful, Terrence. I, is yeah. she? Um, she's is she a um, supervisor of uh, uh, of resource case managers? Pardon me. Uh, she's a resource coordinator mm. there at the San Diego Regional Center. You know, I I think. I, I don't know. I met a Tourette. I wonder uh, if it's the same person. Okay. That came. Hmm. Um, yeah, we'll make sure somehow if you want to meet Therese um, okay. that that happens. We're, we're always, you know, Lisa, I, I know you and I are united on this. Uh, since Garrett was diagnosed, I 100% um, am 100% not transactional. <laughs> Everything is for the long term. As long as I'm here um, living, I'm, this is, you know, what I'm committed to. And um, not only me, you know, the other day, I just wanted to share this. The other day, um, a young girl who's done a lot of work as an intern at Autism Tree was asking me, what is Garrett going to um, do for Autism Tree? And Rebecca, you were there with me. So tell me if you remember it differently. But I said, you know, Grace, I'm not sure, but um, he's going to be here and he's proud of you. And, you know, Garrett started the intern program and and then he and then he got there um, and, she, and I said, Garrett, Grace asked me what you want to do for Autism Tree. And he was like, oh, like no extra words. He said, well, I'm trying to get a really high paying job. I'm applying to law school and I'm trying to make a lot of money. So then I can take over as chairman of the board and really contribute to the foundation. And, um, you know, he has these he's wrote like a manifesto on how to change like special education in our country using names of people who are in office in positions. I mean. It's crazy. I just want everyone to know the level of commitment that that Garrett has to this. Mm -hmm. um, and it touches me because I don't always know that, you know, I didn't know what he was going to say, but it helps gives me some new energy to keep going. Sometimes um, when things like that happen, it helps me a lot. Um, but I, d I just wanted, you know, to say that um, I, I really love some long term things that are happening. And one of them even is with like the San, San Diego Symphony, because now, you know, we always want to have more opportunities to connect, to grow, to learn together. And that that's something that completely happens every lunch and learn. And so one thing that's going to happen, Lisa, that I just wanted to share with you is Jeff is flying out here. Jeff, what is it? Two weeks that you're and he chooses. Everything is on Jeff's. Jeff will tell us what he's coming out to do. And he, he plans his own trips. It's all on his terms. And then I just try to put in like one night of an opportunity, right? Jeff, we went to the San Diego Symphony, but Terrence couldn't go. So when Jeff comes out this time, Terrence and his mom and Jeff and Todd and I and Rebecca were all going um, to the symphony. And it, Terrence, do you oh, remember yeah, yes. him playing? It's your one of your favorites that night, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um... Last time I was there is on, like, is it, I think, July? But this one's Beethoven. I think that's one of your favorites, right? Oh, yeah. I think, um, I like the Mozart. Okay. And well, um, I like Giacomo Puccini. It's one of my, two, one of my favorite composers. Uh, okay. Well, I thought for some reason when I talked to your mom, it was one of your favorites. But the only reason I'm bringing it up, Lisa, is just that we're committed, um, you know, when we can, especially when Jeff comes out, he's been such a huge part of what we've been doing during the whole pandemic. So I just wanted to say that to you that I hope um, you'll continue, you know, we're working with you, but I think you'll find um, a lot of, of uh, wisdom, like some, you know, sometimes when we look at something from a different perspective, mm -hmm. I always learn from Jeff and Terrence, and I feel really grateful that you guys are here. And I'm very grateful that you're seeing that Rich has brought kind of 
reconnects us and and helped us see things um, from Lisa's point of view. And Lisa today is just invaluable. You know, I mean, it's it's just invaluable for you to share so much because you know we all um, grow and have more understanding from it. Um, but I would have never asked you to do that. So it's quite a blessing that it all happened so organically. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rich says has something to say too. Thanks for sure. being here. Absolutely. You can hear me okay? Yes. Well, Lisa, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, what a uh, very uh, memorable and indelible story. I, even though we spent time together uh, I don't think I heard that exact story on Blake. And I was very moved by it. So I appreciate you sharing that. I know that was hard. And uh, oh, I feel for you, what, what you and the family have been through and Blake. And I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to um, work with you and have you um, be a part of what we're trying to do at ATPF to build out programming that will help families get in front of that and if I've learned anything from the time we spent together, there's three, and if I'm, if I'm off, let me know, but there's three major um, focus areas that I'm paying attention to, which is helping a child get placed, right? Mm -hmm. And then the programming and activities that are happening in that home, and it's very specific for each child, so it's not one fits all. And then some sort of inspection or certification or evaluation process for these homes because once the ch children are placed or even the young adults are placed, there doesn't seem like there's a feedback loop. There's not like a measurement loop, right? To say, well, there's like, there is licensing and the regional center, but I think that more eyes is only safety. And so, yeah, I've even thought at one point I tried to talk to the regional center about doing something like almost a you know, the voices for children being a CASA, you know, having people mentor and come in, but there's a lot of problems with, um, uh, you know, um, you know, other parents not being okay with their being, you know, the privacy laws, et cetera. But anyway, yeah. yes, there needs to be more um, oversight. And, and there's just becoming so many more people that are children that are placed that I think it's already starting to ramp up that people are starting to, you know, it's not like it used to be where there was very few. So yes, what you're saying is correct. Oversight, that's the word I forgot. So I got that, but uh, I'm excited about this. And the more people we've shared with what our plans are, we're not waiting for one place to be built. We're gonna launch into this, get this programming going really uh, hopefully full blown next year with your help. Um, I think that is very promising. So thank you again. Thanks, Rich. So Rebecca, do you want to read any of the comments? I saw like Todd wrote a comment, Tessa wrote a comment, anything to share with Lisa? Yes, exactly. It's all, all lovely feedback. Um, Todd said, wonderful presentation, Lisa. Thank you for sharing your story with us today. I look forward to seeing you soon. And Tessa just um, is my program assistant. She said, thanks so much for sharing your story with us, Lisa. The pictures were too precious. <laughs> and I just want to say again, um, before we go, that this is a really powerful moment. I'm really glad that something like this, that a mom like you has shared your story for our community. This is, and I don't want to take away from that. I want to give you all the credit for that, that you shared this and you were vulnerable with us today and shared both the dark and the light. And this is something I'm really glad for people who feel isolated and even before the pandemic, that you brought light to that and that there is there's so many stories out there and yours is one of many and that's why we're here to connect to connect all of those of people who have stories and I think this is like a moment in autism tree where we're shifting and you're at the heart of that and at the center of that so thank you so much I I'm blown away by you and I see your heart and your love as a mom for your son and that you've turned that into fuel to just 
be like a power mom and and change make make differences in this world where it needs to there needs to be justice and so thank you <laughs> thank, thank you for you. having me <laughs> i would love to take a group picture um, with everyone before we go to commemorate this all right i'll take a screenshot so if you'd like to share your camera you're welcome to if not that's all right ready one two I'm here. <laughs> Hi, Joy. Hey, it's been a while. I know, it's so good to see your face. Right. Ready? One, two, three. Cheese. Awesome. Just wanted to say thank you also. Mm. It was a wonderful story to share. Joy has two boys. Um, Jake has autism and Chase has ADHD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and uh yeah and they're growing so fast and it's just been a really interesting time and my partner and I moved in together and he's got two girls who also have challenges so we're just navigating it all for all four of our kids and mm -hmm. um it's just great to see all of you and miss you in person but <laughs> I appreciated your story Lisa and that was really um brave of you to share so vulnerably and really appreciate hearing kind of your raw truth and I feel fortunate I can't relate to all of it but I can definitely relate to some of it and it just shows what a spectrum of experiences we have and it's important to remember that that there are so many different faces on this thing called autism mm. beautifully said thank you thank you, <laughs> thank you guys Everybody have a beautiful day. Thank, Thank you again, you. Lisa. Yeah. Take care, guys. Take care.